I've been working non-stop to get this episode together in time. It's a real JavaScript. As someone with an affinity for the marriage of beautiful glittering abstraction and practical results-driven application, I've always loved reading about the philosophy of programming and software design. As with all sorts of design, there are a number of esoteric and largely arbitrary prejudices in the field that are simply artifacts of an effort to develop some kind of pragmatic uniformity, to gently herd a bunch of creators who pride themselves on their originality into anything but roiling chaos. But there are also ideas that seem to have widespread acceptance among programmers as tapping into some deeper truth about what makes good code guidelines and rules of thumb that should be followed not out of some obligation to conform to the field standards, but to make software that is more stable, less prone to bugs, more adaptive and functional. Curiously, the principles themselves seem largely aesthetic in nature, prescribing a specific flavor or style of coding that feels a certain way. Park an experienced programmer in front of an amateur's code, and you'll likely get an earful about how it's messy or unrefined, maybe even disgusting. These aren't evaluations based on how well the code works. The judge in question might not even know what the program does, but even so, more often than not, they can smell bad programming. As an engineer, I find that that aesthetic bears a remarkable resemblance to ideals that I try to build into physical objects. It doesn't seem totally crazy to imagine that there might be some useful high-level concepts that are shared in both disciplines or even among many disparate types of design. For example, once and only once is a common theme in programming. The idea that every statement of a program's desired behavior should only ever occur in a single place in the code. If you want a button that does X and a button that does X and Y, you don't rewrite all the same code for X for both buttons. The X behavior should appear once and only once in the program and both buttons should point to the same location in the code. There are good practical justifications for this principle. Perhaps most obviously, there's an economy of effort and size. Writing the same bit of code over and over again is a waste of time in megabytes. If you want to change that operation in some way, you only have to change it in that one place, assured that all parts of your program that call for it will now call for the new version, instead of having to troll through code to find every instance where you're trying to do X and update each accordingly. It's also much more legible when someone's trying to read and understand your code to see do x here than it is to parse all the nitty-gritty details of doing x every time it pops up. The idea of limiting the number of expressions of a given function has obvious parallels in many different domains. In engineering, the concept of fully constrained or over-constrained systems warns against trying to define an object's position in redundant ways that might conflict with each other. A four-legged stool can rock back and forth if just one of the legs is too long, while a three-legged stool is always perfectly stable, because each of its six degrees of motion is restricted, once and only once. Many have experienced the frustration of not knowing which of several likely places houses a certain object. Is that marker in the knickknack drawer or the random craft drawer? It can also crop up in institutions where it can be a chore to figure out who you need to talk to because multiple departments overlap in some domain. Look, all I want to know is who I need to talk to to get the name on my account fixed. What do you mean you're not sure if that's a customer service question or a technical support question? Another example. In software, a god object is some part of a program that has grown so deeply enmeshed and interconnected with everything else that deleting or changing it in any way would be catastrophic. Rather than sectioning off the program's operations into small single-purpose modules that can be managed independently, the large, complicated god object essentially coordinates and processes every aspect of the program, seeing and knowing all. This is a problem for several reasons. It complicates any modifications a programmer might want to make, maybe rendering certain changes impossible in the interest of preserving the god object's basic structure and functionality. It can be hard to parse all the different things that it's doing when reviewing code. And 
It can be a little exhausting trying to tiptoe around a 500 pound gorilla that has the ability to bring everything crashing down if it's not carefully minded. Things like god objects can also be found in other fields, like philosophy, where they're not always gods, but simply key concepts or arguments upon which everything else in the system of thought turns. If you kick out the verification principle from under logical positivism, it turns out that the whole thing just collapses. Micromanagers who insist on making all important decisions and hoarding all important information are just begging to be hit by a bus, ruining their team's chances at success. The general consensus among programmers is that, wherever possible, functions should be simple, light, and modular, a useful principle for all sorts of systems. They also believe that when they get too hairy, god objects should be grimly dismantled, bit by bit. Despite how labor-intensive it might seem, the effort is trivial compared to how much time will be wasted trying to appease the damned thing in the long run. In a similar vein, programmers have a particular appreciation for how greater functionality isn't necessarily an improvement from the perspective of the end user. The phrase, worse is better, is a tongue-in-cheek way of referring to this idea, suggesting that a program that has fewer bells and whistles, that is, a worse program, can often be easier and more pleasant to use than a program that can do everything the user might need if they take the time to figure out how. It's also a sort of warning against trying to plan out a ton of fancy features into a program at the very beginning, as it's entirely possible the program's final form will be deliberately pruned down to a few essentials anyway. Part of the programming aesthetic values excellence in a singular domain over slightly awkward universality. Consider the success of one-trick ponies like Minimalist, a to-do list app that trades heavily on not incorporating a ton of features like its competitors. They've built quite a following among iOS users by doing one very simple thing very well. In the physical world, tools and objects that try to be highly multi-purpose often end up being practically useless for any of the things they're designed to do. I love my Swiss Army knife, but I can't think of a time I've used it and wouldn't have preferred having a knife a screwdriver, and a pair of scissors instead. You may have also encountered coworkers who are mired in too many different projects to make a dent in anything, who just want to put their head down and grind on a single thing until it's done, without being called away to something else. They're good workers, but if they were worse, they might be better. Another familiar trope in software design is self-documenting code, the idea that well-written programs are easily parsed by anyone reading them, as if the commands and variables were chosen for the purpose of explaining to a human what each step in the algorithm is doing. One survey found that almost 80% of developers, when asked what quality makes good code, gave an answer something like readability. At first, this might seem counterintuitive. It is called code, after all. These are commands intended for computers, not people. If it's faster or more efficient to achieve some goal with a couple of lines of densely packed, incomprehensible symbols, so long as it works, who cares if a human can't understand it easily? Well, the ideal of code that's so simple and clear that both humans and machines can understand it easily speaks to a sort of universality and clarity of purpose that is generally considered to be a good sign, indicating that the program is well thought out, easily modified, and not choked with unnecessary complexity. There's also an echo of once and only once here. If I have to consult some lengthy document or block of comments to figure out what a subroutine is doing, the intent and implementation of that subroutine are being kept in different places, which is awkward and invites problems. The same sort of principle can be found in the design of objects and systems. If I invented a pair of scissors that required a five-page instruction manual to know how to use, regardless of how clever or ingenious my mechanism, it would be a total failure compared to a standard pair of scissors, which convey all the relevant information about how to use them in their shape. Fingers don't fit in the little hole. They must go in the big hole here. And my thumb, I guess it goes in. Oh, I can cut stuff now. Designers tend to think of labels and instructions as the absolute bottom rung of user interface design, a last ditch effort when all other elegant means of communicating to the user have failed. Ideally, a design should speak to the user on an intuitive level where they want to do a thing and, without even realizing it, find themselves using the object exactly as the designer intended. The object shouldn't need documentation, it should be its own documentation. 
Now, obviously, the aesthetic of programming doesn't apply to everything. One can easily imagine a modern-day Pythagoras whining about how unintuitive and clunky the square root of 2 is, or an authoritarian dictator suggesting that political power should be concentrated in a single person because once and only once is just more elegant. There are plenty of places where a well-meaning coder might ruin perfectly good systems in an effort to make them look more like code and less like whatever actually works. But considering how programming culture has been built around the effective use of abstraction and structure, it's no surprise that there are some useful tidbits in there. Have you found any of them useful? Please leave a comment below and let me know what you think. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to blah blah subscribe blah share. And don't stop thunking.